Welcome to Psychologist Talks. Today we're going to be talking about a relational psychodynamic model of supervision. I've been asked to, to do a short uh, episode on this, and it's a tough one. This has been a doozy. I've actually done a couple uh, shoots at this, and none of them have been terribly successful because it's just a lot of branches we could go off on. And so how to keep it brief and bright has been a bit of a challenge. So let's see if I'm successful this time. So the, the methodology that seems to be working best is first introduce just what is the relational approach, the relational psychodynamic approach entail in more of like a clinical realm. And then how does that translate to a supervisory or, or professional realm? And what's really cool, but also spooks people a little bit is those two worlds are more similar than they are different. They are different in really foundational, really important ways, but they are not massively different. And I think that's newer for a good half of supervisors because some people really wear different hats in life, uh, their personal world and the professional world. Whereas the relational psychodynamic approach says, you know, this is that kind of adage I tell folks is, you know, we wear lots of different hats in our life, but they all are cut from the same cloth. They're all cut from the identical relational cloth. So they might look a little bit different and it's important that they do, but they're all infused by our identities and who we are. And if we don't tend to that and we're not intentional about that, we're missing a huge component of what's actually going on in any role that we inhabit. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, then how does that translate into a supervisory uh, framing context? There's lots of central tenets. There's lots of uh, content about like uh, what is the content that comes up in supervision. We're just not going to hit all of it, uh, but I think we can get through at least some, some central tenets or central ideas that give you a flavoring for what this might be and maybe might encourage you to look further into it. But truly, to inhabit this approach, you really have to be willing to inhabit relational content. Uh, and that's best done through consultation and supervision. Because for some people, for some of you might be real native. For others, this is a muscle that you have to work out. And so last but not least, before I jump in, you also need to be very, very careful with this approach. It has become uh, increasingly popular and thereby also a fad to do more relationship forward methods of supervision, of leadership, you name it. But we need to be careful about this stuff. Uh, same like diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Wonderful, all these things are wonderful things, but they are also dangerous because they are promising a greater degree of intimacy, a greater degree of vulnerability than many people with power are willing to inhabit safely uh, and responsibly. The closer we are, the more vulnerable people who don't have as much power as we do get with us, the more power we have to do harm through retaliation, through ignoring, through deriding, whatever it might be. And so if you like this approach and it sounds neat to you or it sounds cool because this is kind of what we're doing nowadays, like yay, 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 don't mishear and don't misinterpret the state of the field. Just because it's being pushed doesn't mean that it's safe for everybody. It is often better to not promise these sorts of relational kind of vulnerability forward approaches if you do not intend to inhabit them than to promise them at all. Did I say that right? Did I get that right? <laughs> don't, don't promise it if you can't deliver, basically. And if you're not sure, ask people you know. Uh, to give you feedback about what safety looks like for you. What's it like to be vulnerable with you? How do you manage power? What are your defenses that get in the way of how you wield power or take up space in the room appropriately or not? Uh, they're going to at least be somewhat decent indicators of how you do in this. It's not going to be everything. You're going to still have to learn uh, from the people who report to you how you actually do in practice. But that's a good start point as well as research, consultation, et cetera, et cetera. So Truly, I love this approach. I think it's wonderful when wielded well, but that is an emphasis, when wielded well. We need to get away from this like, oh, it's just a cool thing to do, so everybody needs to do it. No, 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 no. So those are my little caveats. So let's get into it. So the relational psychodynamic approach, uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit in, in the realm of like general psychodynamic theory, but then what makes the relational approach so unique? Well, Everything that we are is an amalgam of relational experiences that we have throughout the lifespan. And this is kind of difference number one. Um, psychodynamic folks, I think, always focus on relationships, but they tend to focus a little bit more 
on the earlier relationships. Relational psychodynamic does the same, but it says like, look, there's a lifespan of experiences that we're having that are shaping what we call our object relations. How do I see myself? Well, how I see myself is somewhat me driven, but our earliest selves is, is are, are developed through reflections of others, our parents, our peers, or our family members. Like, oh, interesting, when I do this, I get this response. Oh, when I act this way, I get this response, and I like that response. And we're just playing around and just forming all these neural connections of like, oh, interesting, that's this type of person, that's this type of personality. Ooh, that's the one I gotta be careful on. Ooh, that was the one that hurt me. Oh, that one, the one that, the, that was the one that was really rewarding. Oh, this is how I navigate uncertainty. Oh, this is how I navigate anxiety. All of that is based on our experiences. And we're just constantly, I mean, just ceaselessly as kids, we're just forming all sorts of connections and it never stops. All throughout our lives, this process does not stop. Now, our personalities and who we are definitely does begin to form a little and become a little bit more solid as we get older. But if we're really being healthy, we're always flexible. We're always learning. We're always adapting to our circumstances and our relationships. It's usually, you know, some people older in life get really firm in their ways. This is the way I want it. And sadly, that's where, you know, it can kind of come at the expense of wisdom. Um, It's like that inflexibility and rigidity, uh, it doesn't always help. So the more playful we are, the better we tend to operate. The problem though is we have lots of challenges in our life, lots of relational experiences, whether they're traumatizing or adversity or just challenges in general, that kind of get us stuck in ways of relating to ourselves and others that aren't necessarily the most effective. We all have this to some some degree. We all have these kind of neurotic areas where it's just like this type of person or this type of of circumstance I just don't do as well in. Or these are the situations most prone that I'm most prone to have like my more primitive, not so healthy defenses, boom, you know, pop up and get in my way. We all do this. And the more aware we are of these, the better we can correct them. And so our role as relational psychodynamic folks is to analyze and understand people's pasts and presents and, and, and gain some insight of like interesting, are you noticing this trend in how you relate to yourself or others, and importantly, systems at large. You know, this would be uh, society, culture, country of origin, whatever it might be, that shapes us. Uh, so isn't that interesting? Now that's not universally unique to the relational psychodynamic approach. That's just kind of a universal truth that I think we would all benefit from at least understanding to some degree. But number two is they say, look, it's a little bit audacious for us as providers to be like, you know what? I'm gonna help you with that, but I'm not gonna be part of it. I'm just chilling over here, right? I'm the objective expert, or, you know, I'm gonna unearth, I'm the, you know, the old school psychodynamic. I'm gonna sit here in my chair, you're gonna sit here on the literal or proverbial couch, and I'm gonna analyze you. And even modern day approaches are just as guilty. Now they don't do the, the couch thing, right? But they'll be like, I've got my white lab coat and I've got my bank of science here, and I'm going to prescribe all of this stuff to you and you will get better based on evidence, right? And it's not like wrong, right? Neither one is inherently wrong, but it's just, again, a little bit audacious to be like, I'm thereby not a part of this. Now, again, or not again, let me emphasize a little bit further, I'm not saying modern day or older approaches were like not relational at all. There's still relationships that are going on, but what the relational psychodynamic person says is like, it's not like I'm here and you're here. It's like, we're here. Whether we'd like it or not, we're right here. My mere presence in the room, the dynamics of who I am is going to activate something in the person or people that I'm meeting with. And I need to be aware of that. I need to be a part of that. It is silly that we think we're going to do this whole tabula rasa blank slate thing where like, I'm just going to be an, a, 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 you know, a personless, humanless entity in the room that's going to be the objective expert. It's like, no, you're not. Oh, no, there's no way. You, you are going to activate things in the client and the client's going to activate things in you. So how are you going to form a relationship where you can not only use the past and present, but you can also use the relationship between you and the person or persons you're meeting with to help gain insights as well. Now, this goes back to what I'm, I was saying this, you have to wield this really responsibly. You really need to know your own stuff. You can't just be over here like, oh, I don't know what factors influence me. I don't know my own defenses. I'm not a self-aware person because then you can potentially do harm. You can delegitimize, you can steer people towards biases that you're not even paying attention to. 
Uh, and you have to have open conversations about trust and vulnerability and what's that going to look like and what, you know, what do we need to get to that point uh, where we can call each other out, where we can be frank and direct with one another that if something's not working, you can tell me. If you think some aspect of my identity, you're black, I'm white, I can't at all understand where you're coming from. Go, That's interesting. I can understand parts of it. But you're going to say like I understand none of it? Uh, or if I'm over here just audaciously going, oh, I know what you're going through. I, you'd have every right to call me out. Be like, what are you talking about? You're a man. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a woman. Who, who says you know exactly what I'm going through? Now, I'm not saying this is all you're ever talking about, but you need to create an infrastructure to talk about this so I can be like, oh, okay, I got to own that. Or I can say, I don't know. I wonder if I'm a barometer here. Like what I'm feeling relationally from you might actually translate. You might experience elsewhere too highly collaborative highly you know uh yeah i think collaborative probably encapsulates it's real it really well very justice minded borrows a lot from feminist theory you know it gets a bad rap from some people it's not really it talks about equity talks about laterality talks about joining with people um being transparent with people heaven forbid right uh so yeah, that, that's kind of the general idea. And so you're just helping people gain insights. And okay, so what are you going to do with that? How do you practice? Off you go. And it helps with so many issues. It helps with depression. It helps with anxiety. It helps with paranoia. It helps with you know demotivation, stagnation, whatever it might be. Incredibly helpful for folks that are stuck in more identity or personality or existential related qualms or even troubleshooting why they keep problem solving, but the problem solving doesn't lead to long-term change. Like they keep finding their way back to the problem. Like I know how to solve it in the short term, but the long term, it's still giving me trouble. That's where these things shine. So that's a long-winded talking about, you know, in general, what a relational kind of therapeutic approach is, but guess what? It translates over to supervision incredibly well. Uh, right out the gates, power and laterality. It's right there. Curiosity, uh, participant observer. You're right there participating with. You're not the objective blank slate expert on this side of the room dictating and telling people or your supervisee what to do. All those central tenets are right there. Self-awareness. If you understand yourself better as a professional, you will be more effective in the roles that you hold because all the roles you hold are relationally driven. So in this way, we're talking about the profession as being an art. There is a science, right? There, there's concrete steps that we're doing with any, within any work that we are engaging in, therapeutically, supervisory, leadership, research and design, whatever it might be, you can have those concrete steps. And me as a supervisor, I, I'm here to help you the best I can with those. Now, I'm not an expert on every single approach, right? It's okay not to know. I'm not an expert. You're not going to be an expert. We have our areas of expertise, maybe. <clears throat> expertise <laughs> but but you know we we got to join together and find a way that works but underneath all of those different cool individualized approaches is the human element the human element and so you need to understand what makes you tick what you bring to the table your biases your countertransference, all this stuff and that's going to make you so much better at employing whatever it is that you like to employ whatever your methodology is it's going to be all the more formed, informed, all the more fluid, all the more flexible because you're going to inhabit that relational space and you're going to be really aware of what's going on in here and invite people into that process if you would be so willing. So, you know, if, if I had to encapsulate, so what does this look like as a, as a supervisor? You, this participant observer, if, if I had to like give imagery to it, since I really like imagery is like, let's say you've got a big terrain, like a vast terrain, right? You got mountains over here, you got the forest over here, you got the plains, the ocean, you got all these like really cool landscapes, all these different directions that, that your supervisee could head anywhere. You can go anywhere. Uh, the caves, you know, back there. And I'm just chilling there going like, well, you know, I'm pretty good at the outdoors. I'm not like, you know, maybe I'm the best at the forest, but, you know, I kind of understand the plains. I understand how to, you know, survive in the environment in general. So where would you like to head? Where, where you know, what, what do you think is your growing edge? What is the area that you want to try out the most? And a lot of folks, just because we're, you know, process-oriented work is a little less common these days, 
lots of supervisees will, you know, if you're a process oriented provider yourself, will say like, I want to try out this process stuff. Let's go to the forest, right? I'm like, okay, cool. We can go to the forest, but, but do let me know if there's other stuff too. And we can go all over the place. So whether we go to the forest uh, within which I'm comfortable or we go to the ocean or we go to the plains or whatever it might be, I'm still taking the same role. Even if I feel more expertise, my job is to participate and say, where, where, where do you think you're going to go? Or if they ask me like, well, I mean, I want to know where you go, but I, I, you know, I could, I would typically go this way, but you got to find your own way of doing that, right? Like, so here's a tree. This is what I understand about the tree. What do you see about the tree? Okay. So if I was to chop this down and make like a little, you know, fort or something out of it, this is, this is how I would go about it. But it doesn't mean that's how you would go about it either. Or, oh, isn't that interesting? You're looking over here. I'm looking up here. Or I'm looking over there. What do we make of that? Should we act on that? Should we act on that? I'm not 100% sure either. I don't know. Let's test it out. Go out there and try it out. You know, mess around with that. See, see, see how it goes and report back. And then we'll kind of keep playing around in the forest, right? And I think it's just like a fun way to be a supervisor. And, and, I, and it teaches really cool things. It teaches critical thinking. It, it, creech, it, it creatures. It teaches finding one's own voice. I think it's just a, a really cool approach because it's highly collaborative. And the response from folks, it does vary. I'm not going to say like everybody gives it, you know, amazing uh, reviews, but the people who are really brave and are willing to inhabit it for themselves will tell, tell me like, help me refine who I am and who I want to be, knowing that there's still a journey ahead of me. Like I don't have this ironclad already, but I have a better sense of that. And strangely, in how we interacted, like when we would talk about my history and my past and who I am, like that somehow translated into therapy. Like I found myself asking these reflective, kind of interesting, kind of, you know, not interesting, but like kind of curiosity for questions to my clients and it helped me learn about them. And it's like this like pay it forward relational stance where people start relating differently and talking about trust and taking more risks with one another. And it just creates all this extra content within which any evidence-based or any process-related intervention can thrive because it's just giving you so much more. Um, other folks are like, yeah, I wasn't sure about it for about six months. And then I kind of warmed up to it and I kind of understood where you're going. Then others I know, they they just phone it in. It was just like, yeah, uh, you know, sure. I have relationships with my clients. I don't need any more than that. I'm gonna, I'll tell you if I have some major counter-transference reaction, but otherwise I really just wanted to learn more EBPs so I can put that on my resume and look at me, I'm an expert in all these EBPs. And you know, to each their own. I, I think they they did themselves a disservice because my approach, hopefully latent and everything I've been saying is universal. I'm not like trying to make you into somebody you're not. Uh, but what is this whole vulnerability, trust, power dynamic stuff? What is this whole counter-transference stuff? Like, how do you make useful process comments to people? I don't care if you're doing a behaviorist intervention. If you notice something, maybe you enter that into the room. Might that be a cool thing to do? So kind of varied responses, uh, for sure. But, but to me, universally helpful. Uh, and it takes these kind of more developmental approaches that I think are a little bit more, I don't want to say they're like amorphous versions of supervision, but I think they're just kind of baseline. The relational model just understands develop, uh, developmental model is important. You meet people where they're at, but you take it a step further. You enter this sort of relational frame, this relational energy into supervisory context. And within that, uh, self-awareness and personal growth happens as does clinical growth. And there's still, yeah, you can do concrete stuff. Uh, hey, do you know, um, do you understand, uh, you know, uh, this trauma intervention? Um, do you know, you know, for eating disorders, do you? And if I know, I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll introduce it to you. I'm not like oh, out in the clouds doing relational stuff only, but it's always infusing this kind of more art version of what we do in our profession. Last but not least, uh, as far as content goes, that self-awareness piece spooks people sometimes a little bit too, because when you're going into it, it can feel therapeutic in nature, but you co-construct boundaries around this and say, if it starts to feel too therapeutic, whether it's me, the supervisor, or you, the supervisee, we got to talk about that because it's not that, right? Like we got to understand your past and history a little bit and what makes you tick. But as long as we quickly funnel it to the professional world, we're going to be okay. 
And so if you tear up in front of me or I tear up in front of you a little bit, that's okay. Like, that's it. Oh gosh, we're being human together? Oh, that's horrible, right? <laughs> Sorry, sarcasm. But it, it just speaks to like, let's, let's, let's be vulnerable. Let's be open. Let's learn from one another. Can you learn about yourself? And then can we apply that for why you avoid conflict? Why you get angry at these particular clients? Uh, why you feel demotivated in this realm? What about this sort of imposter syndrome is, is, you know, you've been trying to move through, but there's still something stuck in it. Uh, you know, all these sorts of things live within our personal experiences, which require vulnerability. But with these power dynamics and supervision, they, they, they're going to get in the way of that because you have an evaluative role. And they're going to be like, I don't know. I don't know if I can trust you. You could retaliate. You could, you could fail me. If I'm too vulnerable where I say that, you know, my depression is getting in the way. Well, what's the depression? How is that intersecting? I, you know, if you need help, I hope you're getting help with that individually. But can we understand how the depression is, is impacted by your professional world and how maybe your professional world could actually improve and help with that depression? Like you know, a lot of people are like, oh, my gosh, I don't, I don't want to touch that with a 10 foot pole. That sounds horrible. It sounds like an HR issue. It's like, well, no, you can navigate this pretty effectively. As long as you co-construct really important boundaries. Like, oh, look, we've been talking so much about the personal. It's getting a little bit too therapeutic. I would encourage you to make sure that you're, you're getting some of these needs addressed outside of supervision as well. So, you know, you can navigate that if you have to. All right. So that is like, hopefully it kind of gives an experiential vibe to both the relational psychodynamic approach in general, and then how that translates into the supervisory frame. Um, just real quick, a couple of comments. I can't go through all this stuff, but a couple of comments. I, I, I think I kind of peppered them all throughout, but I want to narrow focus on them a bit. Uh, it's things like power dynamics and, and what, what, what's kind of the frame or energy you're bringing to the table as a supervisor. First and foremost is power dynamics. I alluded to that at least once earlier, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but but uh, the, the, the adage I give any leader, including supervisors, is you're always 51% responsible. The best case scenario when you talk about seeking laterality between you and your report or reports is 51%. You will never go below that. And you should never go below that. Some people, you know, they misunderstand this whole justice-oriented, equity-oriented mindset and that's kind of a fad in the present day. I don't say fad to be insulting, just some people take it in as a fad. It's like, I'm going to give away all my power. And I'm like, well, that's both not going to be helpful because you are in an evaluative kind of position of authority. And even if you tried, you'd fail. <laughs> you know, if you have any authority over someone, power dynamics and how they encounter power in their lives from childhood through present is going to come up in that relationship. And so, you know, I, it's the same thing I say when I'm teaching to like therapeutic interventions. It's like, well, what if my what if my client reacts this way? I would hate for that to remind them of their past. And it's like, well, yeah, we need to be intentional. But our job is not to prevent the enactment from happening. The job is to speak into it when it inevitably does. Same thing with power dynamics. Let's just name the power dynamic. Let's just talk about the power dynamic. Like the, I have authority over you. I have a value of authority. And so isn't it interesting? My values are trust and vulnerability and those sorts of things. You seem to echo them. But how are we going to do that if I have a value of power over you? Like what, what what's going to be necessary for us to achieve a state of you being willing to say that you don't know or you messed up or calling me out on something when I can, I have power. That means I could retaliate. I could minimize i could you know ignore you i could hurt you in various ways so, so what are we going to do to test this out to, to try to earn this trust and the safety over time understanding that i will always have some evaluative authority over you and one of the big ones that often comes up is like just be transparent with me and i i say that right out the gates like if you don't know where i'm at and thinking or feeling how i think or feel about you then i have failed you as a supervisor uh, because then I'd be failing my relational frame. Like if you have no clue where I'm at, I am not operating from, from a relational frame. Uh, so that's like step one. Step two, I will offer vulnerability. This goes anywhere from like not knowing. So like giving permission to not know, but I will frequently go, I'm not 100% sure. Or, Look at these mistakes I made. I, I did it this way and I uh, blew up in my face. And there's something about that. People are like, oh, okay. If he's allowed to make mistakes, I doubt 
he will retaliate if I make mistakes. Um, I'm also vulnerable about my identity and who I am. You know, this is again becoming a little bit more of a fad. People just walk through their diversity framework, their dressing framework. Oh, these are all my diversity factors. And that's not bad in of itself, but I'm going to tell you all sorts of layers of my story so that you know me as a human being. So both so you can conceptualize me, because I know you already are. Of course, you're going to conceptualize me as a supervisor. How could you not? But I'm going to give you ammunition that you could use against me. You could, you could judge me. Uh, you could hate me. You could do all sorts of things with the information I'm giving you. Hey, I'm not saying like I'm over here bawling, telling every deep, dark secret or anything. But I'm giving a very transparent version of myself so that people go, oh, I'm allowed. To, I'm probably allowed to be transparent too. If he's trusting me to not retaliate and use his life story against him, I'm betting he probably won't either. At the end of the day, supervisees are still going to have to trust and test this stuff out. Uh, There's nothing you can do as a supervisor to assure trust right out the gates. You have to earn it over time, and it's a process that evolves. But these sorts of things are going to be very conducive in inviting a supervisee in, remembering, assuming you can wield it responsibly. It's real nice to promise this stuff, and it's real easy to promise this stuff on the front end. But can you really... Practice what you preach when some dynamic that they share is like, oh no, I wonder if that intrudes on their professional work. Can you wield that information with curiosity rather than judgment? Or if they challenge you, are you going to grit your teeth and treat them differently? Or are you going to join them and be curious and explore that and actually engage in some self-correction if necessary? Can you do that? Uh, the adage I say is like, don't promise your kids you're going to go to Disney World and never go. You got to be willing to go there with them. So those are the central tenets. Hopefully that, nah, those aren't all the central tenets, but hopefully this is making sense. Like it's all about relationships. So how do we encounter people when our supervisees more relationally? In that process, we're a participant observer, yet we still will wield power. And in doing so, we're exploring relational worlds for themselves as supervisees, but also empowering how they impl- explore and engage relationally within any type of work that they're doing. And so there is a learning environment for both the concrete as well as the abstract for the what to do's as well as the process comments and how, again, to really connect with people in responsible ways uh, that opens up a whole slew of content that, uh, to me, can help us learn about ourselves and become better human beings as well as really better and more effective clinicians and providers. So uh, I don't know if I hit everything, but that that is, what is that, take number five or something? I hope I did something okay on this one, and, I, and, and it sounds good. Uh, but uh, if you're interested, again, research more. Uh, I love doing uh, consulting and supervisory work around this stuff too. Look for other relational folks. A lot of them are based out of the Northeast, but I'm sure they spread across the uh the America, uh, um, the America <laughs> spread across the states here, I'm sure. Uh, but outside of that, uh, also be curious about like, maybe there's parts that you'd like to incorporate. That's the really cool thing. Like this is not imminent domain of a relational psychodynamic approach. We're, we're, we're very loving and sharing people <laughs> like, please take parts that make sense to you and jive, uh, in other areas because even our approach is based on approaches before us too. Uh, that spit a lot of wisdom before. Hopefully, we've been spitting wisdom uh, to folks in the present day. So, yeah, I hope it's been uh, helpful. And, uh, yeah, as always, stay court. Yeah, I'm ending this very poorly. As always, stay curious.